All right. Looks like I am live here. Want to welcome everyone on Giving Tuesday. Um, hopefully you supported all the awesome nonprofits out there doing great work. Um, but it also coincides with December 1st, which is Avalanche Awareness Month. Uh, since we started Jones, we've been uh, celebrating this month, uh, really trying to uh, not just spread the message, but I personally use this month as a time to hone my skills, uh, get back into the kind of mindset, um, dust off the gear, dust off the rescue skills. So I want to kick it off this year. Um, how's my volume? Just every volume good? Everyone good on volume? Okay, we're good on volume. All right. Um, so want to um, kick off this year. Uh, it's a special year. We know we're going to see a lot of new people in the backcountry. Uh, welcome that. But um, I guess, you know, with that, we look at, you know, backcountry serious place. And so tonight, I'm just going to kind of break down uh, what it's like for me to go into the backcountry. Uh, I like to say uh, experience is something you get just after you need it. And under that, uh, those guidelines, I am incredibly experienced. I've made a lot of mistakes. Your sound is a little muted. Okay, hold on. I'm going to try this. Get some fancy headphones. Um, okay. I'm just assuming that's better unless I hear something different. But, um, so yes, going back to, I just want to, um, so I've made a ton of mistakes, which makes me very experienced. And I guess the, the humiliating part of the mistakes that I've made is, um, they are separated perfectly by like eight to 10 years. I calculate that there have been, um, three definitive incidences where someone could have um, died with me in the mouth, you know, part of my group. And, um, and so I kind of wear those incidences um, on my sleeve I, and just recognize that, you know, I continue to study every year. Um, and the sad part is I, I'll have the scenario, I'll learn from it, and then years will go by without any scenario. I'm like, cool, I'm making good decisions now. I got this figured out. And then, boom, another major close call, catastrophic scenario. Go through the cycle again, happens again. So there are no experts in the backcountry. Um, so I guess moving forward, going... Um, if you're thinking, um, you know, you want to go into the backcountry, and I call it pregame. It starts the night before, um, and even the days before. Your head should be in the mountains, and my wife is sick of hearing that. But, um, but you know, first and foremost, understanding the Abbey report. Uh, whether if I know I'm traveling to a place, I'll start kind of keeping my eye out on snowpack. Uh, and then if it's my home range, whether if I'm there or not, I'm always keeping an eye on the snowpack. Avi report, um, it's awesome. You can get it on Instagram. You can get it on Twitter. You can go to the actual site. Um, and so the key things, um, you know, the ratings. It's when it's high Avi danger, I sleep super well, considerable. Abbey danger, um, and I sleep well on high Abbey danger because I'm either pow surfing, uh, I'm probably pow surfing at this point, or riding the resort, but the resort's a mess, and so pow surfing for me is just taking the intensity off of those mega days, and I know that if I can't get out of my driveway, the roads are a mess, the mountain's a mess, and I just go pow surfing. Um, but considerable also just really consider that as um, high avi danger may tiptoe in with the right plan and then we get moderate which is um, the most common avi rating the one that kills the most people and so with that um, 
specifically looking for um, what we call spooky moderate. And that means there is deep instability in the snowpack. And when you go through your AVI report, you go down and when you see, um, you'll see likelihood of a slide will be like a medium likelihood. And then size of slide, meaning if it does slide, it will be large to historic. Those are the, we hate that. That means that it's tough to get something to slide. If it does slide, it's gonna be cat catastrophic. I could treat that as, as high AVI danger. Um, and when there is deep instability in the pack, I am on the AVI report consistently. Um, and every night I'm going on and, and really what I wanna see is photos of avalanche activity. And if there's any AVI forecasters out there, I want that in the top of the report. I want the rating, and then I want to know if there has been any avalanches in the range the day before that day, recent avalanche activity, because you will see consistently, um, it's like you're a slab investigator, and you will go and see like, wow, the av you know, I saw three photos of avalanches at 8,000 feet, um, you know, with lightly treed area, this aspect, and they all broke a similar way. That's incredible. Um, that is really all I want to see. It's just, so that's the AVI report, please, photos front and center. Um, so I guess, you know, with that, so I'm going night before, um, depending on the cycle, like, can I cross off any terrain? And so another thing I'd love to see on AVI reports is a compass rose, which has aspect and elevation. And um, Zahan taught me this. He, every year, he starts a fresh compass rose and he puts a dot on that compass rose where there is avalanche, where there's been an avalanche. So pretty quickly, you know, he shows me his compass rose and it's, Northeast aspect between 8,000 and 9,000 feet has got a ton of dots on it. You cross that off. You know, all right, you're staying away from that aspect. That is a very important thing. Zahan taught me to start crossing stuff, terrain off the list before you even go into the mountains. And it's crazy how many times I've been like, we're staying away from 7,000 foot northeast aspect only to be standing on a beautiful, sunny, most gorgeous looking line you've ever seen on that aspect and being like, and trying to talk myself into it. And it's like, I crossed that off the day before, this morning, da 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 da. So get that, um, really be thinking before, this is before you've even left your house. Can I cross off any terrain? Um, the most important decision you can make in the mountains is picking the right riding partner. Um, it's, you know, for me, what I look for first and foremost is, um, I hate ego in the mountains. If I see ego, I run from it. Um, it's also something that I deal with. I'll start nailing lines and then my ego gets big. So, um, really I can't stand ego in the mountains, um, that I've seen many times where you go out and there'll be an inexperienced group and then there'll be this guy who's the leader who took his Abbey one course and I've watched him dig pits and he's just telling his crew like, yeah, we're good to go, da, da, da. And it's like, again, like running around like an expert, I just hate it. It's, it's, that's just not how you do it. And then for me personally, um, I call it the um, love of sport gene. I wanna be in the mountains with people that love it um, that a good day doesn't require perfect powder. Um, you're in the wrong sport if you go out every day and are like, I need to score powder today, and if I don't, I'm grumpy. Like, the, I, those people don't work with me. The goal is to go out and come back safe. Um, if you're an expert mount, you know, rider at the mountain, the backcountry, you're a beginner. Um, I don't care. It's kind of like you need to go and just stack time um, in the mountains. And so these like people that maybe they're the most experienced in the group and they always kind of overplay that or it's common to see people overplay their experience card. 
and make stupid decisions. Um, so a big red flag is if someone's digging a pit and then digging the pit and coming out and being like, pit looks good, let's go. And it's, I literally had a guy do this once um, and right that, you know, you could see natural avalanche activity on that. And he was so caught up in his pit that he didn't even realize it. And I'm like, man, I, you know, that, like pits are great information, but they should never open up more terrain. Um, so now we're going in the mountains. We're, we're at the trailhead beacon check. Um, I can't tell you the, you know, there was an accident last spring, two accidents last spring with experienced riders um, that for whatever reason, um, their beacons were not on. There was a third, the actual beacon turned, you know, I'm sure you guys, some of you have heard about the peeps, certain peeps go on their website, that's a different story. But as I've gotten more serious about beacon checks, I do these for myself. I um, forgot to turn mine on. It's like, I would say 10% of the time we go into the mountains, um, someone has forgot to turn on their beacon and this is with expert crews. So it's, some people will give you attitude and that is bullshit. It pisses me off when someone's like, what are you doing checking my beacon? Check my beacon. You see me in the mountains. I'm gonna, and you're doing a beacon check. I'm running towards you to get my beacon checked. Get it's a mistake that everyone can make. Um, so now we're getting ready. We're starting to walk into the mountains, and I'm really even that morning. Um, I try to um, what I call mental keys, which are put myself in the present moment. Um, it's the mountains require your attention. It's a great time. We're all glued to these phones. It's a great time to put them on airplane mode and disconnect. Um, I really, you know, I don't listen to music or that much in the mountains, um, but what have you. Anyway, be present. Um, again, I give myself this, you know, be humble, no ego talk like really uh i you know i constantly have to keep my ego in check and then uh, especially if it's a big day say cameras are ready it's the day of the year i say over and over in my head just say no just say no patience you don't need this line and i am prepping myself for um, i'm thinking about reasons that i need to turn around um, and or things that, um, you know, really almost expecting to turn around, but if things go right, then, then it's a go. Um, another thing, red flags. You see that, we put it on our boards, we put it everywhere. I put that on for me. Um, and red flags, you know, they're just front of mind stuff. We can get so caught up in these AVI reports and this and that and that. It's like um, Jim Conway taught me the red flags and it's basically new snow. 90% of avalanches happen during or within 24 hours after a storm. So really simple, give it 24 hours and you've just increased your chances of getting or decreased your chances of getting caught in an avalanche by 90%. So that's a basic, that red flag happens before you even get out of bed. Um, signs of natural avalanches. It goes back to seeing the photos on the, on the, um, you know, the AVI sites. You see avalanche activity, you sure as shit better be avoiding that stuff. That means natural avalanches are occur uh, have occurred. That should really get your spidey senses up and, um, and really just look at all that, anything of that aspect that hasn't slide as guilty. Um, cracking or whooping. Uh, so it's when you're skinning, it's a great opportunity to feel the snowpack, ideally not in avalanche terrain, but you will see, um, you can see cracks between, you know, the snow cracking on your tips. And, and so a lot of times I will get off the main skin track um, and just walk in fresh powder and feel that when you're doing kick turns, um, steep kick turns, a great time to just jump on the, on the, on the slope. I will go out of my way and find these 
little convex rolls that are, you know, this big. Um, and if that, you know, jump on that convex roll, and if that little thing's cracking, that is a little um, scaled down version of what you're going to ride. Um, wind, wind is a really, wind is really dangerous, and I think that gets more experts than anyone because you can be in a scenario where you are just been slaying it in the mountains for days on end, and then a little bit of wind comes up and it takes totally stable snowpack and it can change it. Um, so I used to, for a long time, was like, is wind really a red flag? And then sure enough, I ended up with Rylan Bell um, getting caught in an avalanche and ending up, you know, 600 feet below and going, wind's a good thing on and same deal we've been nailing lines for days on end and a little bit of wind and we were even camping and didn't feel the wind on our tents it was a very weird scenario um and then rapid heating uh that you know we feel that you can see that that also can especially um it's important to know when you get into this spooky moderate stuff the red flags um are that's a, a whole different beast and i recommend anyone that's in say these continental snowpacks of Colorado, Utah, like you really gotta, um, that is, you know, surround yourself with, the, with people that have been in those mountains for a long time, take the AVI courses in there. That is a whole different form of witchcraft that I personally, I am not an expert in. Um, so uh, moving on, Clean terrain, picking clean terrain. The most important question you ask yourself is what happens if this slides? And you have to be real about it. I can't tell you how many times I'm crossing a slope. You know from reading the AVI report, you're worried about a layer that's you know one foot, two foot, three feet deep. So you're calculating that. You're like if this thing right here slides you know, three feet deep, I'm dead. I hate that answer. Um, and clean terrain can erase a lot of bad decisions. Um, so it's, it's, you know, outside of picking the right partner, it's the second most important thing you can decision you make. And I've seen really small slides in serious places, um, be incredibly, um, you know, high consequence people die in that scenario. Um, and then the contrary, I think a great example of anyone that's watched a TGR film, we could make a highlight reel that just looks like a horror movie. And the reality is, is um, we're in clean terrain. We're taking high risk in clean terrain. Um, and that allows you to, you know, play around with different things in, in, in clean terrain. So, um, Yes, stay away from the dirty stuff. Um, and I guess that goes to, unless, if it's, a, if it's not a screaming yes, then it's a no. Um, that's a new mantra that I've been um, really bringing into the mountains, especially those lines when I'm walking in the mountains and going, what happens if it slides? You're either broken or you're dead. That needs to be a screaming yes. Um, so moving forward, um, I'm going to get to some questions, but um, time of year, uh, as we get into this early season right now, um, you know, simple right now, our danger is, um, you know, early season is small avalanches drag you through rocks that can kill you. Um, the snowpack with this low sun angle is just so much more complex that in my head, um, I'm really thinking spring. Um, yes, you can get into these stable, epic, dreamy December, January, even you know February stuff. But in general, the here someone says, "What is clean? Clean terrain means if it slides, you're not hitting um, trees, you're not going over cliffs. It's just totally smooth. It's not going into a gully." Um, so yes, clean terrain means that it would fan out into a perfect example is why you've seen so much high-end snowboarding in Alaska. You got a steep face with a gorgeous flat glacier 
And so if something slides, it hits that flat glacier and it just, um, you know, fans out. And if you're not going over rocks and it's a nice, um, not a terrain trap, you can survive those. Um, so yes, no terrain traps. That would be dirty, um, dirty terrain. Um, big open bowls with nowhere to go. That's that, even though that looks like clean terrain, that's not clean terrain because if the whole bowl slides and you're smoked, um, a really dangerous one. We have a hut that we go to a lot. And um, I always, there's someone passed away right past the hut. And I swear it was like a 200 foot, um, you know, just barely steep enough to slide open. Um, face into a stand of trees and it was just enough slope to for that person to get just enough speed to hit a tree and pass away another example of dirty terrain um so yeah going back to time of year it's like the the november december january froth is ridiculous um i feel it but I, in the back of my head i just it's like calm down it's and if you're new to the backcountry, the spring is your time um low avalanche right now we have low avalanche danger another great time to to it you know acquaint yourself with um with the mountains um and the backcountry um if you are new it's like going to really well-known trailheads at um when it's low avalanche danger and and get over the fact of like man i went into the back country and i rode moguls if you're new to the back country you should be riding moguls um the so it's it yeah and i guess another um just going to the the new new to the back country i high yes take the avi course that's um, a great thing, but just taking one Abbey course to, doesn't mean shit, really. It's a great start. Um, find mentors. Be with, um, you know, find people more experienced than you. And another thing that I don't see enough of is hire a guide. Go in with all your buddies and Hire a guide, especially if it's in a range that you're going to spend time in. And don't just hire the guide, but think of it as your personal AVI forecast. You want to be asking them questions the whole time. What about this? What about that? Why aren't we going there? If they're digging a pit, you get in that pit and you feel that out. And it's just the best way. And, and I do it when I'm going to, um, especially if I'm, going to Europe or someplace that I have no experience with, we go in first couple days, without doubt, we are hiring a guy just to give us the history of the snowpack and really understand what's going on. Going on. And so you could, I could argue, you know, you can make a case for um, taking your four buddies and going out with, a, with, a, with the right guy. Jones has a bunch of ambassador guides, but there's a lot of really good guides now. Um, three day, three full days in the mountains with a really good guide that um, is breaking down their whole thought process with you. That you could argue that is better or the equivalent of an avalanche one course. Um, so don't discredit that. Okay, um, almost ready for questions. Sorry, I haven't really been reading them, rattling off a lot here, but. Um, just back to time of year, I can't tell you, um, it's like the real goal, especially if you're new to the mountains, like the spring is such a wonderful time when the mountains are rock hard, you time the melt freeze, um, you know, you get up early, your only concern is, is heating, and it's that's when we make the movies, that's when um the mountains really can open up for you and and just the the complexity is so much simpler that's not to say it's not dangerous but it's like we love it when in the spring you get into a scenario where um the you know maybe it's been warm for two weeks or there was rain or what have you and then you get snow on top and and the real good snowboarding that we do is when we're only digging our pits you know this deep because 
We know everything below that was just rock solid bomb proof. And then we got, um, and, and then we get this, um, you know, fresh eight, 10 inches on top of what we know is bomb proof. And all we're, we're, our pits are this deep. That's a, that's the type of stuff you can start, you know, potentially sending stuff. If you're worried about a layer three feet down, um, man, that is, you, that I don't have the skills for that. That's just really complex um, stuff, and and you can have it. Um, and I guess you know that brings me to the what I call the art of big mountain riding, which is um, you know it's good to have goals in the mountains, and I certainly do. And um, it's it's the ability to have total commitment to a goal. And oftentimes for me, that could be where we're camping underneath this thing for weeks on end and waiting for that perfect day and, um, and you know, be totally committed to this goal, hiking your way up the mountain, realize maybe wind came, heat came, you saw something you didn't like, and in an instant being like, it's time to go down. And, and walking away from that goal with um, with zero concern, with with just no um, scar tissue with that, um, and celebrating that, we really celebrate backing down. Um, I have surrounded myself with people, but you know, you can imagine when you're making a movie, it's you know late in a trip, maybe it's been bad weather, and it's like that is the day. Um, that we've all been waiting on. The, I'm standing on a line. I'm dying to ride it. And something I don't like about it is it's just I'm not feeling it. Spidey senses are up. I come over the radio, say, hey, sorry, um, you know, not feeling it. I'm going around. I have surrounded myself with people that will always come back on the radio and be really good call. And that person probably hiked for, you know, woke up early, hiked to the other side of the deal to get their camera angle or what have you. Be with people who celebrate backing down. Um, we are in a zero mistake uh, sport, especially on the serious line. So, yes, the, uh, the art of riding is being able to back down. But then that brings up, I'll just touch on fear a little bit, is um, I've learned, you know, what is real fear, what's boogeyman fear. And boogeyman fear, for example, would be when we first started um, climbing these big lines um, on foot, specifically like in Alaska, we you'd have to wake up. Um, you know, a lot of times we'd start hiking at three in the morning, and you're in glaciated terrain, and you hear in sounds, and we will um, be like, man, it's not safe, even though the day before in perfect daylight, we were like, the plan is to follow that boot pack, hike this, da da da, da. Um, But, you know, we all are afraid of, afraid of the dark. Another thing, you know, maybe someone's hiking a mountain, they got crampons on, but they feel like it's, they're, you know, it's scary because you're off the deck. The reality is, though, crampons, you're not coming off that mountain. That's boogeyman fear. And being able to understand if it's boogeyman fear or you're worried about, you know, the world coming down on you and getting caught in an avalanche. Um, so the last point before we go into um, questions, what we are doing is this special, beautiful um, thing. It's truly a gift. Um, you have to respect it. Um, you sure as hell should be celebrating it, no matter if it's bulletproof, it's cloudy, it's rainy, what have you. If you're out there, um, you're doing pretty damn good in this world if you have the ability to you know, be in the mountains um, and protect it. Um, and, and obviously, you know, there's the work I do on climate, but it's also... We're seeing with the new users in the mountains um, in the summer, we're just simple, um, you know, there's more trash out there. If you see trash, pick it up. Um, don't pee on the skin track and things like that. Just understand basic etiquette. And um, and yeah, I like to say, send while you can. It's, 
you know, the days when it really lines up are so few and fine, far between, where it is like stable and powder. Um, that's when it's time to jump the day, beat the alarm clock, and, um, you know, get out there early and go big because uh, mountains are always changing. And when they do lie down, uh, it's time to get after it. So, um, all right. Don't <laughs> so, any questions? I got old cooling in here. Yeah, anyone who pees on the skin track is bad news. <laughs> um, so, that's what's the best month to ride in the Tahoe area backcountry. Um, man, it's such a crazy time. You know, who knows? Like, we just came off of. Um, you know, like before Thanksgiving was incredible um, week of riding, and now who knows when it is. So you got to be nimble. <laughs> it's like I think of it in surf terms. When it surfs up, be ready to go. Um, I have an older. No, I don't want to talk product. Um, the, okay. Um, what resort did you grow up for? I grew up back east. Um, been to Taos, love Taos. What a special place. I think you guys might have good snow right now. Um, any advice to what to do if you do get caught in an avalanche? That is a great question uh, because I had a friend get caught in an avalanche um, and he told me, you know, what it was like, which it's like this crazy spinning, you know, you're... Um, getting tumbled, ideally you find, you know, you, it's like being caught in a wave or being rushed down a river. You'd get your bearings, ideally, try to get your feet down the hill, um, get ready. You know, you don't need to be at the top while it's cranking. It's like, as soon as that thing, you feel it starting to slow down, swim for the top um, and make an airway and relax um, and just really go into deep breathing. It's not a time to panic and be happy that your friends are badass and they're well-trained and they're positioned in the right spot and they're going to come and get you. So you just hang out. Um, so yes, airway, if you have an extra hand, punch it to the top. Um, but yeah, swim like hell for the top and ideally get, get up there. Um, airbags, electric or compressed air, electric's better for travel. Um, so I'd say either works, um, it, it, and, but if you are traveling, you gotta make sure you can get a canister on the other side. Um, do I consider myself a pioneer in the outdoor activism? No, I don't. Um, that People have been doing amazing work on that front for a long time. Um, you will be able to watch it again later. Have I ever considered hard boots split boarding? Yes, I have a set of hard boots. I spent a ton of time in hard boots racing. Um, I got friends in hard boots and and yeah, they they work. Um, but I like the ankle feel. I'm a surfer um, and I just, I can't, I love the ankle feel. Um, California wildfires versus snowpack. I, who knows on that? Um, I got no comment on that. Central Coast is firing this week. I know, let's surf. I might see you there. Um, favorite Grateful Dead song, Partial to Fire. Um, okay, I am gonna, sorry, I'm going through question. How can I get a, help others connect to the mountains who aren't the most outdoorsy? That's a tough one. Um, I'd start slow. Um, and with my kids, um, it started with a lot of chocolate and celebrating the outdoors with, with hot chocolate at the end of the day. Um, do I resort in California that is good for getting into the backcountry? I mean, the beauty with the Sierra is you can often wait for low avalanche danger and mess around um, where other places that just doesn't get low. Um, what are the five red flags? Colin, you fail. <laughs> Went over that. Colin works at Jones. He sh I think uh, how he doesn't have it tattooed yet, I don't know. Um, Books or other reading for 
um, live app? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I'd say the simpler, the better on the Avi books. Um, Wild Snow has an old one that's killer. Bruce tremper has got this Bible that's impressive, but I love his smaller version is really good. So um, um, Backcountry Books, I think it is, has a bunch of good stuff. What is the worst decision I've made in the BC? Man, too many. Um, so... Um, what? Do, sorry, questions are fast. How do I stay so positive in challenging times? Well, I wrote a piece for the intro to the Jones catalog last um, last year, and it was on we are in the golden era of um, of splitboarding of backcountry for sure. Um, split boarding and you could make the case for backcountry skiing and obviously there's a bunch of heavy shit going on in the world but um, and I don't mean to take light of that but you know my buddy went and got a new knee and took him 45 minutes and now he's kicking my ass on the skin track we got badass split board bindings we got the most insane avi forecasts going we um we, you know, there's so many examples of, you know, we used to think 40 was old. Now it's like I'm getting people that are in their 60s are crushing me on the skin track. Um, we have 10-day weather forecasts. We have, there's just so much. We have insane bank slaloms, terrain parks, you name it. So um, health and happiness and, and we're... You know, there's a lot to be grateful for, um, and there's a lot that we need to kick ass on, obviously on the climate front, and um, but sure as shit should be celebrating every day and, and be grateful that if you are healthy, sleeping well at night, um, and have the means to go snowboarding, you are kicking ass in this world. I think drone technology, drones are interesting. Um, the finding cornices, drones are great. I, I, and I'll just say the one of the, the single thing that freaks me out the most in the mountains from a terrain feature is cornices. And the trickiest thing to do is to walk up from behind and find a break on a corniced ridge. Um, you cannot roll the dice on that. That's also something that has killed many a legends. Um, it's in Tahoe is a great example. Um, there was, I lost a friend, Jamil Khan. I mean, he was 15 minutes from, uh, the trailhead and I, it's in our most traveled backcountry zone. There's tr it's this beautiful treed meadow, and every time I'm with someone new, I can't help but point out and go, just past those trees is an 80-foot cornice that has killed multiple people. And Jamil was 18, and it was really sad, pro snowboarder. And um, so, yeah, cornices, stay the hell away and do not walk blindly to a corniced ridge. I have multiple times, well, my biggest mistake, if someone had a question, I had a cornice break on me and I, and I had a fall. That would have been my fourth life. Um, and 1,200 foot fall, released an avalanche, easily could have died um, and was not a loose cannon. I was going rock to rock and, and it was just such a big cornice that it actually, I wasn't on it. It broke and it sucked me down with it and I think I lived because I was behind the cornice as I fell um, so yeah cornices kill um, is it unwise to ride solo on off days I mean I you know that's an interesting question low avi danger I ride my bike solo all the time and and it's funny nobody's like yells at me for that even though I'm whizzing by trees but you go out solo and it's a, um, people are like, what the hell are you doing? And certainly in avalanche terrain um, scenarios, it's, it's not, I do not recommend it, but this is an interesting, and I'm gonna close on this thought because uh, time to go. But, um, you know, 
an interesting exercise is to go into the mountains without a beacon and without avalanche gear. And I have forgot my beacon at the trailhead and I have decided to go into the mountains. You didn't hear that. Did I say that publicly? Oh shit. But, um, but no, it's, so if you think about it, an avalanche beacon, yes, they are helpful to have. Um, but they don't do shit if you get washed into trees. They don't do shit if you get washed over rocks. They don't do shit if you get into some major, um, if, the, if it's this huge avalanche. So why do I put on an avalanche beacon and look at the mountains differently? Why do I, because I got my shovel pack and with my shovel and my probe, my beacon start taking more risks. And so I've heard, you know, Josh Jesperson talk about this, um, going into the mountains by yourself in avalanche terrain. And you certainly take, you basically avoid avalanche danger. But why, just because we got this little box on us, do we then say avalanche danger is okay? Um, and so that's something to, to chew on. I definitely recommend partners. and. And the second to last, this is the double encore, um, but this is to everyone out there. Um, make sure you train and we'll post on the Jones site. We have so much badass content coming out this year uh, for people that want more info. Um, we have how to pack your pack, how to do Neil McNabb breaks down every single step in a 12 part video series. It's one of the best guides in the world. It is incredible information. We have a total hub of information. We're not the only ones. We link to um, other great info out there, but it is the golden era to learn on your phone. You can get so educated. And I forgot what I was going to say. Um, so I'm going to leave on that. What the hell was I saying? Absolutely. Safety gear is a false sense of security. Um, airbags definitely um, are a good thing. Um, but, oh, sorry, I got it. Last thing, then I can, can move on with my life. So take your buddies, go into the mountains. We'll put this on the Jones site. It's really simple, but um, we do this every year and, and um, Go out with the people you ride with. You can do this at the resort. It's good to tell patrol that you're doing it so they don't freak out. But um, you basically say so you can get, whether it's in the back country or your backyard or what, I like to go, um, you know, whether I'm touring, like an actual riding scenario. Everyone's in their gear and put a beacon, an extra beacon, hide it, um, and when people don't talk about the fact you're going for drills, even if you tell people like, Hey, we're going to do some drills today and just yell avalanche and train with purpose, train like it's real. And you will be amazed at the junk show on your first, um, Abbey rescue of the season. So this is stuff that we do and it can, as short as, um, in an hour, you can snap off like two or three rescues, and the difference between the first rescue and the third uh, beacon search rescue scenario is astounding. Um, so definitely uh, get after that, and, uh, and again, whether you're a pro, beginner, like you don't need to do an AVI course to just go out and bury a beacon and, and practice like it's real, and just repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And then we do scenarios where we'll pull the person, um, the person who hit it will be kind of off in the distance. They'll come back on the scene with an injury or lie down on the snow and we'll then deal with first aid stuff. So that's all I got. Thanks for everyone for tuning in. Um, and yeah, again, bunch of epic info on the um, Jones site and all, all over the place. I'm loving to seeing, um, for a long time it was, it wasn't a thing, and it's like this year feels like an industry-wide December AVI Awareness Month, uh, which I can't uh, be more excited about. So have a good night, and we will talk to you later. I can turn this off.
You're stuck with me, man. 